Video games don't need NFTs. There's an ever-growing number of video game developers and internet personalities begging you to think otherwise. But the fact remains that no one yet has come up with a compelling use for NFTs in gaming that can't already be done by existing technologies cheaper, better, less exploitively, or some combination of the three. So other than to make more money, what are NFT advocates saying are the benefits of using these digital tokens in our digital games? First, let's do a quick explanation of NFTs and the technology that they rely on, blockchain. If you're confident that you already understand these topics, I'll leave a timestamp on screen for you to skip ahead to. NFT stands for non-fungible token. Fungible essentially means replaceable, so something non-fungible is not replaceable, and a token is something which represents a thing but isn't that thing. Let's use the metaphor of a coupon for free ice cream. If both you and your friend have a coupon good for one free ice cream, those coupons are fungible. Even though they are physically two separate coupons, they both represent exactly the same thing. They can be replaced by each other and nothing changes. An example of non-fungible coupons would be if you had a coupon for, say, chocolate ice cream, and your friend had a coupon for strawberry ice cream. Whilst the physical coupons are very similar, what they represent is now different. So they are therefore non-fungible coupons. That's what the NF in NFT means. We'll talk more about the T for token in a moment, but first, let's quickly talk about blockchain. A blockchain is a long list of information about who owns these ice cream coupons. This list is saved and backed up on typically thousands of computers. This makes blockchain a pretty reliable place to store information, because if one, two, or even hundreds of these computers go offline, the information that we want from the blockchain is usually still accessible because there's still many, many more computers with duplicates of that information that are still online. It's also worth noting that information stored on a blockchain is entirely public. Anyone at any time can come and take a look at who owns which ice cream coupon. Because of this, most blockchains are used to record information about ownership and changes of ownership, referred to as transactions. So this ice cream blockchain stores information about who currently holds which ice cream coupon. Each time a coupon is traded from one person to another, a bunch of computers connected to this blockchain have to do some really complex computing to confirm that the trade is legitimate. And only if enough computers agree that the trade is legitimate does the trade actually succeed. This means it's extremely difficult to fake a transaction on a blockchain due to the fact that all of these unrelated computers have to agree that the transaction is indeed legitimate. So when we put all of these concepts together, we end up with a long list of information that is reliably online all the time, that is really hard to put fake information into, and is therefore a pretty great place for us to keep a record of who owns which ice cream coupon. But the important thing about NFTs is not the non-fungibility, nor the blockchain on which they're stored. The important thing is the T for token. In other words, what our coupon actually represents. And, spoiler alert, it's not an ice cream. When you buy an NFT, what you actually do is add a record to a blockchain that says, this so-called wallet address owns this token ID. A wallet, in blockchain terms, is an application that you can log into to save your purchases, such as NFTs, and this is usually done through a third-party website. This token ID that has been stored in the blockchain then typically points to a website address. In other words, a web page not stored on the blockchain. This website address typically points to metadata about the NFT, which is basically some short information about what that NFT is that has been purchased. For most NFTs, that metadata file then points to another web address, again, not stored on the blockchain, and on that web address is what is most commonly an image file. If any of these connections get severed, you can either no longer prove that you own the NFT, or the NFT itself is gone. If you can't remember the password for your online wallet, then you can never log in and prove that you're the one who owns the associated NFT. If the wallet provider goes offline or gets hacked, you can no longer log in to prove that you own it, or the NFT has been transferred to someone else's wallet. If the link your NFT points to, or the link within that file which points to the image, 
is deleted. Then your NFT is gone and your token just points at nothing. Or one of those links could even be changed to point at something else other than your original NFT. And that could very well be something unsavory or even illegal. And your wallet is now verifiably the owner of that unsavory file. And there's nothing you could do about it. Because when you buy an NFT, you don't own the image or really have any legal rights at all in the entire situation. You have access to a wallet which has a record on the blockchain, which points to a URL, which may point to another URL, which may in turn display an image file. So to quickly repeat that with our ice cream coupon metaphor, it's like you have your ice cream coupon stored in your actual physical human wallet. And of course, you could lose your wallet or you could lose or damage the coupon. The coupon itself has a tiny, unique number on it. And etched into the stone wall outside of the ice cream parlor is a long list of coupon numbers. And next to those numbers is the name of the flavor that the coupon number represents. When you go up to the ice cream counter, underneath the name of all the flavors is not the actual ice cream, but a piece of paper that briefly describes the ice cream and then points to a location in the freezer where you can finally find the actual ice cream. This is a physical analog for the relationship between an NFT owner and the thing that their NFT represents. And it's important to clarify here that the ice cream parlor controls all of this part of the NFT ownership. They can at any time and with no repercussions, close the door and not let you in. Remove or change any of the details on the ice cream's label, or of course, remove or change the ice cream itself. And just like an NFT owner does not own the image, at no point do you actually get any ice cream. The only thing you can do is stand outside the store pointing at the wall and wave your coupon and say, hey look, I have the chocolate ice cream coupon. Anyway, all of this is exactly the same as with NFTs in gaming. If you have an NFT that represents an in-game gun in a shooter game, that gun's stats can be nerfed into the ground, or the gun's appearance could dramatically change, or the item could straight up be removed. Just because you own that gun as an NFT, it doesn't actually change anything about what the developer decides to do with that item compared to if it were just a regular non-NFT gun. And every online game has an expiration date. Eventually, that game's servers will be switched offline and your gun will no longer be accessible. You'll still be able to show that you own the NFT on the blockchain, but the in-game item, the thing that actually matters, is gone when the game is gone. Now that you hopefully understand a bit more about what NFTs are and how they actually work, you should be in a better place to understand how every benefit NFTs apparently offer video games can already be done without NFTs and already exist in multiple forms across games and platforms. The first argument for NFTs in games is that your proof of owning an in-game item exists outside of the game itself. And with pretty much every argument apparently in favor of NFTs, this can already be done and already is done. On Steam alone, you can see people's inventories for hundreds of games without entering the game itself. There's even non-Steam websites for many of these, like Backpack TF or TF2 items for Team Fortress, or Bungie's own website for Destiny 2 items. All of these already existing implementations let you view things like names, pictures, attributes, unique information like who crafted an item, or that item's unique ID number, and so on. The only thing an NFT would be able to offer is viewing the unique ID number on the blockchain. Any additional information would have to be stored and displayed on a third-party website. So if we need a third-party website anyway, what even is the point of the NFT? NFT advocates would probably argue that the point of the NFT in this instance is that ownership of the in-game item persists after the game dies. And whilst this is indeed true, that proof of your ownership of the NFT will exist on the blockchain, no matter how long after the game goes offline, it is of course completely worthless. Remember, the only thing actually saved into the blockchain is the item's ID number and potentially a link to more information that is hosted on a separate website. 
If a game is at the point where the developers have chosen to no longer support its in-game servers, then it's probably not long before they stop hosting the website that holds information about the items too. Sure, you can still access the online wallet that shows you are the rightful owner of item number 69420, but what that item does, or what it looked like, is lost to time. That is unless, of course, someone took some screenshots or a video or views it in a historic version of the online stats page on a site like archive.org. But none of these things require NFTs to make them possible. If you want to brag to someone 50 years from now about your Team Fortress inventory, you can record videos, save screenshots and download web pages right now and congratulations. You have something more valuable than the NFT gamer whose pure NFT solution would only show an ID number that leads to a 404 page not found. Or even worse, that retired website address has now been taken over by someone unscrupulous and it houses something a lot more questionable than the stats about your virtual gun. Sort of following on from that, some might argue that the value of the NFT is the unique number itself. You are the one and only owner of number item 69420. And uh, once again, this can exist without NFTs. And once again, it already does. In fact, behind the scenes, most games are probably already keeping track of who owns what by using unique numbers anyway. Those numbers just aren't exposed publicly because, well, What's the point? Who's going to care? With that said, there can be value in exposing these numbers. For example, in the case of limited or promotional items. If we look at Team Fortress 2 again, they've got multiple versions of this practice. Numbers in the item's name, which show when it was crafted, like this cosmetic called the Dr. Woe. This is the only Dr. Woe in the entire game whose name is followed by number three, because it was the third one ever crafted. There's also items like the Gentleman's Service Medal and the Golden Wrench, which have the same information in their item descriptions based on the order that these limited time promotional items were obtained by players. And whilst these unique numbers in this example are only applied to things like item name or description label, there's absolutely nothing stopping developers putting these unique numbers directly on an item's skin. Again, there's plenty of examples of this out in the wild already like CSGO skins where you can apply your own custom stickers to. Or again, in Team Fortress 2, there are items you can straight up upload your own image files for. The technology to put unique numbers on in-game skins is right there, and it's nothing to do with NFTs. One thing that NFT game items do offer is the ability to be traded and sold without opening the game that they're from. And as you might have guessed, this is already possible without NFTs, and yes, it does already exist. The same Steam inventory viewing mechanics we talked about earlier also allow the trading of items. This can be done on the Steam desktop client, on the web, or in the mobile app. NFT advocates might argue that the value is not in trading one NFT item for another NFT item, but in trading NFTs for money. Well, digital money. But yet again, yet again, this exact thing already exists on Steam, where you can sell your items on the Steam community market in exchange for credit in your Steam account. Whilst this credit is locked to your Steam account, there is absolutely no reason that Steam couldn't send this to your bank account if they wanted to. There's no technological limitation. There's no problem that NFTs are solving here. NFT supporters also say that the value is in selling your items after you quit playing a game. Well, from a technology point of view, this is exactly the same as selling the items whilst you still play the game that we've just described. If you've ever heard of someone cashing out of a game, that act is exactly this process. In fact, selling game items or even whole accounts has existed for years on third-party platforms, and whilst not available in Steam itself, Many Steam items can be traded or sold on third-party websites. Marketplace.tf is one such site that lets you trade Team Fortress, Dota 2 and Steam inventory items for actual money into your PayPal account. And there's CSGO skin trading sites that even let you trade for cryptocurrencies without NFTs being involved at all. An expression you hear from NFT fanatics often is, imagine taking a skin from one game and using it in another game. And the good news is that you don't have to imagine this because it's already entirely possible and exists 
without NFTs. One example that comes to mind is between Portal 2 and a game that you might have noticed by now that Valve likes to experiment with, Team Fortress 2. Simply owning one of these cosmetic hats in Team Fortress 2 automatically unlocks the same hat to wear in Portal 2's co-op mode. This is exactly the thing being touted as being enabled by NFTs, and it happened all the way back in 2011. Now sure, both of these games are made by the same company, so making this possible was probably relatively simple for them. But sharing a hat between Team Fortress 2 and, say, Fortnite would be no easier or harder if it was done with NFTs or without. Both companies would have to model, texture, and implement the hat into their own games and engines. And both companies will have to program their game to periodically check whether you still own the item in the other game. The only thing that NFTs actually bring to this scenario is the inbuilt security and reliability of a blockchain database. But for all the other negatives associated with this technology and the ever-increasing security and reliability of traditional database solutions, which are available to major game developers these days, simply communicating directly with each other's databases periodically is going to bring them pretty close. And besides, the important thing to note here is that sharing items between games is entirely possible without NFTs. Play to earn is not really an NFT concept but it's often bundled with NFTs. It's the basic idea of earning something of value whilst you play a game. This can be in-game items that are NFTs, cryptocurrency, or even just in-game items or in-game currency. For the final time, I tiredly say, this is possible without NFTs and it already exists. We've already mentioned TF2 items, CSGO skins, and other Steam inventory supported games. All of these are already this play to earn concept and they've existed for 10 or more years now. People have been spending full time working hours leveling up accounts in countless MMOs and selling accounts and the items that they collect in order to make a living off it. And that's been happening for decades. The reason I believe that play to earn as a concept is so often bundled with the ever increasing chatter around NFTs and cryptocurrencies is because it's pushed by exactly the same exploitative people who want you to spend your money on their virtual tokens and in-game items in thinly veiled pyramid or pump and dump scams, all of which take place on this decentralized blockchain and therefore are anonymous, legally ambiguous at best, and relatively easy to get away with running scams on. So to summarize, all of the things people argue NFTs can bring to gaming can be done and already are done without NFTs even existing. Developers just have to choose to implement these features. Oftentimes there's probably good business, financial or logistical reasons that these features aren't more common. And again, those reasons are not because it's too difficult without the benefits of NFT technology. And to clarify, I'm not debating whether any of these concepts are good ideas or bad ones, just illustrating how NFTs are not what makes them possible. Video games, don't need NFTs. 